All right, thank you, Kelly. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this relatively short because you have a lot of, of information that's going to be going on today. Um, but please contact you know, Kelly or th me or through Kelly, you can contact me uh, to talk about some of the salinity issues. Depending on where I am in the state, I find that some of the growers have no clue that there's any salinity issues occurring. There are some that have been well aware with the, of it and have been dealing with it for a while, and some that are kind of in between. So in reality, this talk's going to be a little bit more of a wake-up call, um, and we'll talk a little bit about management, uh, but I'll point you to some places where you can get some more management information towards the end and as we continue to develop more m materials. So that being said, what are salts? A lot of times people aren't really clear on what that is. Essentially, it's anything that's going to be in an ionic state. So typically, you're thinking it might be calcium, chloride, things like that, um, you know, or sodium chloride, sea salt. Um, but there's actually more than just those. Your potassiums, your nitrates, uh, the things that are going to be coming from your fertilizer sources are also going to be contributing uh, to your salt levels that are going to be there. Boron's another one. And when you think about what are the sources that are coming from, sometimes it's going to be dissolution of your parent rock material or your soils. And as that starts to, you get dissolution into solution there. Um, but your irrigation water can be a primary source as well, um, either in terms of Sorry to get that off. The, um, your saline groundwater might be a factor. This might be from saltwater intrusion, as I mentioned here at the end, but it could also be just tapping into brackish aquifers, depending on where you are in the state. That might be underlying. As you start to draw down the fresh water, you start hitting into some of these more brackish aquifers as well. And as I mentioned, your fertilizers and uh, manure, if that's going to be land applied to any crops. So essentially what happens is you're adding your salts to the system, say from your irrigation water. What's going to happen is it starts to percolate down uh, with the water, but then as your water dries out and you get evaporation, the salts are going to start moving back to the surface. And so it's, your water management is going to have a lot to do with how your salts are going to be moving uh, in the system. And then over time, they're going to start to accumulate towards the surface. So you've got both the constant influx of the water that uh, uh, might be bringing salts with it, as well as the salts that are in the soil already. So it's a combination of both of these that you need to be aware of. And so while we're dealing with uh, more of the issues in Florida, a lot of times it's going to be, as, as mentioned, you're drawing down, you're going to have this fresh water that's keeping your salt water intrusion back, or same thing could be happening where it's keeping a brackish aquifer down. And as you start pumping this water, it's going to be bringing in, and then the salt water is going to start coming in from this end. And so where your well that used to be drawing fresh water is now going to start drawing some of the salt water. So a lot of it's trying to keep that cone of depression back uh, and that, that pressure back. You can see throughout the state, basically if it's in pinks, that's where they're starting to see more and more uh, salt issues that are occurring. And so you can see up here it's inland, but of course down here we're talking about a lot more of the, the salt water intrusion that's coming in uh, from the Gulf. The other thing, this is going to be uh, the changes in piezometric hedge. This is basically the ground water withdrawals. And as you withdraw more of the water, you're going to be pulling more of that salt water in. And you can see down in here as well, they're starting to get more of that pull, so more salt water is going to be moving into the system. And this is just some sample data, just trying to show that this is a factor that's going on. This is actually more from uh, North Florida. And that's one thing that we were talking about earlier this morning is getting some more data for South Florida and down in this area, particularly in regards to the wells that you all are drilling from. If you don't already have data, it'd be interested in getting some of that. And that's going to also be changing uh, depending on the rainfall. And it's going to be flushing some of your salts down and pushing that um, freshwater barrier back in. So that's what you're seeing here in September. These are all relatively high values when we're talking about threes and fours. And I'll get into that in a second. Um, and then in October, a lot of those dropped back down. They had gotten some rain in between, and then was able to counteract that. You can see some of these wells, though, because of how they're situated over the brackish aquifers, they're still, regardless of the climate and the, or the weather, they're going to be running into salinity issues. So sometimes it's going to be a temporary issue that you might be facing. Sometimes it's going to be a little bit more permanent, depending on the situation you're facing. So I'm going to breeze through this. Uh, this is more if you ask for a copy of the presentation uh, to give you a little bit, because these, there's a lot of different units that are used for salinity and without turning this into a math class and the conversions. But essentially, you're going to be hearing me talking about Desi Simmons per meter or uh, uh, 
That's usually the unit that's used. But you'll see that a lot of these, as they're converting across, are all essentially the same. So, and then if you talk about, you know, sometimes you'll hear um, total to solve solids, which turns into parts per million. And then that's going to approximately convert to 1,000 to 1. So if you hear the number 3 or 3,000, those are all equivalent, regardless of what unit that's being used. So if it's 3 decisiemens per meter, that's going to be the same as 3,000 parts per million. So just trying to give you some idea of, of what these numbers are when we start talking about them. So here, what are the thresholds that you're going to be facing? This is in general for different types of crops. But when you're in the soil, as we said, when you get to about three, which we were seeing in that other um, slide earlier, that is, some of those were well above those, are getting closer to six, you're starting to have impacts on your moderately sensitive crops. Um, but even at one, as low as 1.5, depending on the sensitivity, so if you're doing things beyond citrus, these are all things to take into consideration. Uh, but then here now, this is looking at irrigation water. So while that was looking at your soils, now you start seeing when you get 0.75 to 3, those are the levels where you're going to be getting detrimental effects uh, on your sensitive crops, and you're going to require some management. And by the time you get over 3, um, your salt-tolerant crops are starting to have some issues as well. So again, just trying to give you a feel for the different numbers that are based. So what happens is essentially you're getting what's called a chemical drought. As you get your salts increasing, it's going to get the water is going to be less available, and consequently with that, a lot of times the nutrients will be less available. So it's going to tie into some of the talks that you're going to get later today as well of how available are some of your nutrients going to be when you put those into the system. A lot of times you're not going to see specific toxicities. Um, it'll be a lot more subtle than that. And so it can sneak up on you at times. And it's going to depend on uh, the plant that you're dealing with, the, the different varieties of trees or different species uh, that you're dealing with, as well as some of the soil properties, necessarily going to run into these obvious issues uh, move forward. So tying this more into citrus, here you can see grapefruit, oranges, lemons. What this is, is this is a graph of your percent of your yield of normal. So this would be normal yield with no salt impacts. And across the bottom here, we're talking about the deci siemens per meter. So at five, um, if we were to go up, you're going to get a 50% reduction in yield, theoretically. This is all going to depend on your system, the soils, and everything else. But these are pretty standard graphs that have been used worldwide. So now if you start getting here 2.5, you're still going to be getting somewhere around 20, 25% reduction in yield. So this is just another stressor that's impacting to potential yield uh, reductions as well. So those are things to be thinking of in terms of specifically. And then so these are some uh, graphs that I got from Brian Bowman's publication, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, where this is actual Florida data. Here they're looking at oranges, and this was the basically the percent of the yield of what would be under low saline conditions. You can see as you start getting 1.5, 2.5, 3.5 deci siemens per meter, we're starting to drop down you know, 20, 30 percent crop loss. So this is data from around this area, I believe, that you can see if you're wells, those are all pretty realistic levels that you might be facing. Similar to grapefruit, same idea that you're getting, you know, 20, 30 percent loss depending on where your well is if you're in the twos and threes for the deci siemens per meter. So as I said, this isn't going to go too much into the management, but give you some ideas and I'll point you in the right direction and then I'm sure we'll be having uh, if there's interest, some more presentations in the future of how's the best way to manage this, but it really comes down to the water and your fertilizer management and trying to limit some and mitigate some of the effects. Because a lot of times you're stuck with the water that you have and it's how's the best way to deal with it. Um, a lot of times if you start getting up above these levels of the 1.2, uh, as we were talking about, you know, the 1,200 parts per million, uh, irrigate frequently and maintain that soil moisture. Because remember, what we're saying is, is that chemical drought is you're binding up some of that water. So as long as you keep that water in solution there and don't let it dry out, then your nutrients will be more available. Your nutrients will be more available as well. Um, use fertilizers with a lower salt index. So that's one thing that, depending on your different fertilizer types, it can be a big difference. Um, I think it was anhydrous ammonia is about half of the, uh, what you'd be getting for um, just some of your nitrate fertilizers, and then urea is a little lower. And there's tables that are going to show you what are your different levels of salinity. 
So depending on what your form of fertilizers you're using, you could be limiting your salinity additions by half uh, very simply. So that's one thing to consider. Uh, another time is splitting your applications up into smaller increments over more periods of time. Or ideally, if you can, do an infertigation and spreading that out. So rather than getting a dose of all your fertilizer salts all at once, you're spreading it out. And that will help make sure that you get more availability of the plants without adding to the salinity aspect. And then also some of the uh, foliar sprays that you might be using. Uh, try to pick ones that have a lower uh, salt index as well. So essentially what you want to be doing, though, is by keeping some of the water high is you get some leaching. And this is where you have to do that balance because you don't want to be leaching your nutrients out of the root zone, but you want to be pushing your salts down when possible. And so the idea of trying to push them below the root zone. And a lot of times if you're using drip or micro-irrigation, um, since I'm assuming most of you are in one of those systems and not seepage, that would be a whole other uh, talk that can go a lot more into how you manage it. It's a lot more difficult. But basically just trying to keep, constantly keep that water pushing it away so you have the water available to the plants but pushing the salts down and not letting those be brought back up to the soil surface and be around the root zone as much as possible. And then these are just some quick charts in terms of leaching fraction. And essentially, as you start moving this way on your curve, this is putting more and more water on to try to push it down and then how it's going to uh, impact different crops. And you can see the more water you put down is based on a leaching fraction, which you can be easily calculated. And that's basically how you push those salts. And you can see you can bring it down quite considerably by just making sure that the water leaches. And then this is just a soil profile. And essentially, the more water you're putting on, you're pushing, this is the salinity levels. So if you're not leaching it out, you're going to start getting up at these higher levels. And you start pushing it down. And you're pushing sort of that plug of salt further down in the soil profile down away from uh, the plant roots or the tree roots. So there's a lot more detail on some of this management on this EDIS document. This is the only one that's currently out that's dealing with salinity. And fortunately for you, it's dealing with citrus. And Kelly and I and a couple others were working on a number of other EDIS documents. And we'll continue to update those. But this will give you a little bit more information on the management for the irrigation systems, of, of both in terms of the amounts and our different situations and different times of year that I pretty much summarized into one slide due to the sake of time. But other things that you can start thinking about, um, you know, the obvious one is if you switch crop type, that might not be something you're interested in or even relevant, but that's something that can be done and go into more salt tolerant crops. Um, if your wells are in really bad shape, you might consider backfilling those. But uh, the other thing is if you were to drill new wells and you spread them out, so you're saying you get this cone of depression, you start pulling up from some of these brackish aquifers. If you had a number of wells there and you're spreading that out, so you're drawing from a number of different areas rather than one, that might be another solution to maintain that you're pulling from those uh, more fresh upper layers. Again, it's going to be dependent specifically on what your situation is and how the water is moving. And the other is using alternative water sources or using those conjunctively in terms of what the, your well water is. Um, if you have a storage pond for rainwater, you could be mixing that in, and that's another thing to reduce some of the salinity that might be coming from irrigation water. So in conclusion, uh, basically, as I said, this is really just trying to make you aware if you're not already, and uh, definitely make sure that you're monitoring your wells uh, to see if this is an issue. Because like we were saying, you can get crop reductions that can sneak up on you, and then tying it in with, as we were talking about earlier this morning, with the additional stressors with greening, it's another one of those, it's, just, it's another stressor that if you can mitigate that can offset some of the other issues you might be facing. Um, and then coming down to, there are some ways around this by just working with your water and your fertilizer applications. You know, just switching to a fertilizer type if it's appropriate, uh, putting a little bit more water on. These are some simple things that can counteract some of that salt stress that you're facing. So. If you need any more information, please feel contact me or uh, Kelly. And Kelly can get you in touch with me either way. We're working together on this project. And you know, I'm interested in working with you more as I start moving more, some more work down into South Florida a little bit more and getting more exposed to some of the, the citrus uh, production as well. So thank you. Any questions for Jack? All right. Take it easy.